This is Pete Moore on Halo Talks NYC, sheltering in place. I have my friend from a long time ago, we just reconnected, the author, the strength coach, New York Yankees, Long Island, Strong Island friend and foe, Dana Cavalier. Welcome hey. to the show. Thanks for having me, Pete. Good to see you. You too, man. So uh, I just wanted to kick it off because I just read the book, you know, like basically last night. It was, Dana was kind enough to send it to me. I just want to start off maybe you know, with some words of, from, from uh, uh, Mariana Rivera. I want to quiet the noise. I want to slow everything down. And I want to take this podcast one minute at a time. I like that. I like that. So, Strong opening right there. Damn. <laughs> you, baby. All right. So give us your background. Talk about working at the highest level in the major leagues. And then you know, we'll talk about the book. And I got some other private riffs set up to zing you with. Cool. Let's do it. No, listen, I, I grew up on Long Island and, um, you know, I went to Queens College for a year. I played baseball there and I realized very quickly that, I, number one, I didn't want to be in Queens. And number two, I didn't want to be in the cold anymore. So I decided that I was going to go down to the University of South Florida in Tampa. And I wanted to walk on to the team down there. And little did I know, once I got there, I talked to the coach. He said, Hey, we don't have walk-ons. So very quickly at 18 years old, my life had to change and pivot. And I decided, listen, I'm not going to play anymore because I sized myself up and I knew that I couldn't play at the level I needed to play at by my own. It would have been awesome if they had the internet back then where you could just go online and be like, yo, can I get into USF and actually play on the team and say, no, and then you would have yeah. picked a different school. Well, you know what? Actually, it's funny. I, I probably <laughs> wouldn't have because I, I knew all these pro teams were down there. Uh, and you know, on Long Island, what pro teams do we have besides the island? Islanders, yeah. or, you, know, you got the Yankees in the Bronx, but but I just felt like going to school down there would provide a good opportunity. And, and it did. And literally, the Yanks were 10 minutes from my school, spring uh, training. And I, I used to ask you how you guys got it connected. I didn't think of the spring training. Yeah. That's, how, that's how you got there? That's how I got there. I started awesome. interning with the with the football team actually at USF. And one day in February, I took a drive over to Steinbrenner Field in Tampa, and I'm sitting there literally taking pictures of all the guys through a chain link fence as as a fan. Right. And I get back to my internship that day, and the coach I'm working under says, "Hey, Dana, listen, man, um, I just got a call from the coach with the Yankees, and he wants to know if I have anyone here that would want to hand out water, hand out towels, and basically keep the place clean." And I said, you know what, man, I just got back from there. I would love that opportunity. When do I start? And he's That's like, unbelievable, dude. Yeah, it's crazy. He's like, you start the next, you start tomorrow. So I, I drive my beat up. It was like a Mazda 929 hoopty back in the day up to the stadium. I park right up front the day before I was like two miles You're away. You're a badass. Yeah. Yeah. You got like a, yeah, my low like ride. a parking pass now. <laughs> Exactly. Right up front. And they threw a credential around my neck, C for clubhouse, F for field access. And next thing you know, I'm on the same field. I was taking a picture of a day earlier. So Dude, that's crazy, man. Cool. That, that, I was going to ask you how, like you got to the Yankees and you're going to tell me the story about, I've been the strength coach, assistant strength coach. I got from here to here, like a college football coach. And it's like, nah, dude, I just went to spring training and just taking pictures. That's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It was a crazy, it was a crazy ride. Cause you know, as a kid on Long Island, I never, I never even saw a pro athlete, you mm -hmm. know? So here I am down here in, in Tampa and I'm like, this is, this is an amazing opportunity. So what'd you do? So, you, so how did you go from, uh, it's like water boy to yeah. like the top strength condition guy. Only well, through spring training or, or only through the summer? No, so I started there just with spring training. When the Yankees okay. left, I went and I would work the afternoons. I would do what's called extended spring training with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Okay. And then at 4 o'clock, I would leave there and I'd drive over to where the Toronto Blue Jays had their A-ball team. So the Yanks went up north and I'd spend my afternoons with Pittsburgh and I'd spend my evenings when the Toronto was home working with their A-ball team. And I just sort of, I, dude, I got, I got paid nothing to do this, but I knew that it was my chance to sort of cut my teeth. Do you like that, uh, that writer? Who's the writer that got on the plane with like the Beatles or something or <laughs> See that movie? almost famous, almost famous. Yeah. Yeah. You like the guy who just like was in the right place just like through yeah. hard work and just like presence. He just like made it happen. It's crazy how, how, it, how it works out. Like, you know, I, I like to say I, I put myself in those positions, but I really... Yeah, physically. I mean, yeah, I physically, physically did. Physically did, right? 
but to connect all those dots and get the breaks, I, I don't know. You know, there may have been a little something else working there. All right. I be- got to believe in that. So, um, you know, let me ask you a question just about being a strength coach in general. And you're playing with your, your, your take, you're basically in charge of the most elite athletes in, in your field. Yeah. So I had this question, I was thinking about this the other day, like when somebody gets hurt, do they like, do people give you the business and be like, Hey man, how did you got like, not take care of this guy to like the ultimate optimal potential. Yeah. I mean, definitely the, the strength coach, you know, is the ultimate fall guy in, in professional sports, because, you know, it's almost as if the more we paid the players, the less accountable the players became to their own behaviors. So it's just sort of what, what goes with it. But I got to tell you in knowing that it makes you better because you don't want to be the guy that it falls on. Yeah, sure. You know? And I, I remember, you know, I kept data points as many as I could. You know, I was the only guy that knew how many times the guy trained, how many reps, how many sets, how many exercises. I was able to quantify everything. Ask the hitting coach how many swings he took that day, the player. They have no mm-hmm. idea. So my, my department was actually the only department that was able to quantify activity. So, so you were, this was, you started back in, was I, it... Uh, I, I started in 2002. 2002. I, yeah, 2002 to 2014. That's, so, that was my run. So, so thinking about like the pace of technology and like, you know, clubs doing, you know, yoga classes and spinning and mm-hmm. functional training and, you know, some guy, uh, who's the pitcher that does that thing? He just like shakes the, uh, shakes the, the bar. Yeah, there's, there's a a, a lot of pitchers would use what's called, it's called a body blade. Yeah, most, body blade. Most yeah. pitchers actually would use that more in a rehabilitative setting for, for that's where they get introduced to it. And a lot of guys tend to stick with it. So I guess the question for you is you seem, you know, you and I have known each other for a long time, but not uh, close. I don't really know how you, how you think, except for when I read your book yesterday, yeah. but from a scientific standpoint and from who you are and being a champion and striving to be a champion, I assume that you always want to be on like ahead of technology or like, Hey, I'm a first mover in this, but at the same time, like it, that's some of that might be too experimental. It might be too, you know, far East for people to like say, Hey man, I just want to lift weights. I don't want to do this, yeah. you know, jujitsu well, thing that you want me to do. Well, that's a lot. That was a lot of the culture back then. So you have to, you know, you have to be patient, right? There's players that won't let you touch them until they become most vulnerable. When does a player become most vulnerable? When they're injured. So there's guys that I literally wouldn't, that I'd, I'd meet early and I'd have an instant click, instant relationship, and they'd let you do whatever you want, right? But then there's other guys that are slow to warm up, but when they get hurt, they have to spend more time with you and they get to know you, like you, trust you, and they know you're not a bad dude that's going to turn on them. So they trust you yeah. and they let you do whatever needs to be done. But, but when I started, this was pre baseball analytics. It was pre money ball. So actually how I cut my teeth in the game was very simple. We had no data points on players. So I said, wait, what would my role be here? I'm basically an asset manager of $300 million in human capital. That's the way I looked at it. And that capital has to deploy every night at seven o'clock during the week. You know? Um, So I started saying, what do I know about my players? How can I start to predict injury? So I started to measure how much rotation was in the shoulder, how much was in the hips, and start to ident- identify discrepancies and imbalances that could and oftentimes do lead to breakdown. Now, is that, is that requisite knowledge that you already had? Or did you go and find somebody from like Mount Sinai orthopedics, you know, research lab that's doing some interesting <laughs> tests that you heard yeah. about? You know, Pete, I didn't, I didn't really know much when I first started. I was sort of, I didn't have any tools. So I had to study to create an edge and to create an angle. So that was my angle. This was back when core training wasn't a thing. Functional training wasn't a thing. So here I am, 19 years old. I show up and I, st- and I know about these things that nobody else really knew about. And I had to because that was the only edge and angle that I had. And that's what I sold. And it worked. Gotcha. So when, you, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about, you know, you're an asset manager, or you're like the, yeah, you're like the head guy for a $300 million return on asset 
you know, if we use like a KPI, like yeah. what's your return on assets? Like, all right, we won a championship and we made 60 million bucks. So it's like a 20%, you know, cherry on top return on assets. Thank you. Yep. You know, Dana. So a question that I'd have for you is why don't companies deploy something at least a little more similar? Like I got to show you something. Else. Where is this here? I got to show you this. So every morning I print this out and I, and I laminate it. So these are all the deals that we're working on and every like thing I need to do. Right. Yep. So I think I'm like an offensive coordinator. Cause I'm like doing plays like this. Yeah. My laminate in front of me because I want to feel like I'm more of an athlete. Like, I feel like I've given up. I came back to Westbury. I'm like five miles from you right now, probably. I came back here and I'm like playing sports again. I sent you to kick it field goals. Yeah. Like I'm an athlete. Like, this is where I used to be an athlete. I got a hockey stick. I got cleats coming today that I'm excited <laughs> about. I'm messing around, bro. Yeah. So I guess the question is like, why do I have to give this up? Or why was it ever given up? Why didn't, why isn't there a, you know, head of player personnel instead of like HR? Why isn't yeah. there like a quarterback's coach? When someone's like, hey, I want to get a life coach. Why the fuck not? Do you like every quarterback's got a quarterback's coach? Yeah. Listen, I, I, that's that's what I do now. Actually, I remember I took a walk home from the stadium. We were playing up in Toronto and I would always walk home from the ballpark from what, wherever we were. But I remember distinctly one fall day in Toronto, 45 minute walk from um, the field back to our hotel. And I, I had an idea pop in my head and it was based on the simple thought process of if the greatest athletes in the world have coaches and teams hire these coaches to keep these high levels of talent doing what they're supposed to be doing and moving them through a process. Why don't companies have this? And I said, when I get out of baseball, that's what I want to do. I mean, it's been going on for, it's been going on for 50 years, but it's almost like it either hasn't been marketed properly or it hasn't, or people don't fully understand the benefit of Dave and I've got a buddy of mine that's our our executive coach life coach and and friend and I, I kind of view him I tell him all the time like he's like my Mr. Trampoline you know <laughs> he's like if I get somewhere like I'm either he's gonna help me make sure I don't hit the ground or he's gonna give me something that says hey that was right like you know or say hey that's an interesting 2022 idea you know yeah so like he's a he's my only governor on my thoughts because if not I'd be sending out 150 emails a day of like what do you think of this idea? What do you think of this idea? Yeah. So I'm confused as to why companies haven't embraced it and even use like the same terminology. Yeah. Hey, we've got I an offensive coordinator. We've got a pitching coach, catcher coach. I mean. Yeah. I think, I mean, just what I see when I go into companies, you have unsupported workforces going to work every day. And then you say, man, how come our culture sucks? How come we're not getting the most productivity out of people? Well, you have high levels of distractibility. You have low levels of engagement and you have no levels of support and support is more than, Hey, you know, here's 10 grand extra for the year. Support is, Hey, Hey Pete, what makes you tick? What are you after, man? What are you looking for out of this? You know, what's important to you? Here's what's important to me. What's important to you. And we find when I know that I know how to manage you. I mean, we kind of, Dave, we kind of done that, uh, you know, to an extent of like putting down goals and, and going through them. But I 100% agree with you. If people just had a more of a voice and understood, forget all the rhetoric and the marketing and the other bullshit, like, hey, what's like the mission of this company? And can I articulate in 60 seconds as an employee? Yeah. And then, hey, look, I'm not, don't send me like a $50 like class test card, you know, yeah. or like a $100 Amazon card. Like have someone talk to me, say not only how are you doing, but like, what can I do? I was reading this other books. So they're like, the, the goal of a manager, a leader, or a coach is what can I do to make you better? Yeah. It's not even, it has nothing to do with me, which is kind of in your book, you know, the give to get. Bam. Yeah. The, the, the key word is, is you, because I, I have this saying, and this is the way I approach our teams every year. Teams are made up of individuals and individuals are made up of a lot of individual experiences that make them who they are, mm -hmm. where they live, how they grew up, what they've dealt with, the fears that they have, the anxieties, the stress, the masks that they put on to hide all that, right? Yeah. When we can sort of uncover that and allow a person to fly free, they're going to be very productive for you. Or they may tell you to go fuck yourself and say, hey, this environment's not for me. It doesn't align with who I am. And that's okay, too. You know, yeah. I feel like um, 
when you think about like the pol- pol- politics for a second, like the, the U S definitely slanted towards like a more liberal freedom. You know, you want to smoke your marijuana, smoke your marijuana. You want to yeah. get people out of jail quicker. That's cool. Um, you know, you want to marry whoever you want to marry. That's great. So I guess the question is why haven't companies, why haven't gotten to a place where, like I said to that article I wrote, which is like, you know, Jerry Maguire, you know, self-reflection, Hey, I'm fucking human just like you. And, you know, mm. I got bad days and, and I got good days, you know, like everyone yeah. else. It's not a highlight reel, actually. It's it's actually a movie and it's sometimes tragic. You know, it's sometimes <laughs> really funny, but it's a movie. So I guess why haven't, like, is, do you think this coronavirus might be a tipping point for people to just be like, hey, look, I'm not perfect. I'm like a B plus, which is awesome, you know, yeah. but, you know, I got feelings that I'm going to do things that are wrong and I'm not going to, you know, post my highlight reel up because of that I'm going to post everything or I'm going to post nothing. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it, and it's okay. I, listen, I, I hope I hope that they would do that, but I, I say the reason a lot of people don't do that or don't feel comfortable doing that is because the old style of leadership. It's like that old, like you know, Titan New York City Titan. It was a dictatorship because that's how they were raised. I mean, most families were raised. There was sort of this dictator parent that said, "This right. is what you do. I tell you what to do, and this is what you do." So you have what's called I call it a dictatorship leadership style, dictator leadership style, when at the end of the day, what people really want and what they need and the styles that'll win today, the collaborative leader will win more yeah. so today with their people than, than that dictator. So let me ask you this, because it sounds like we grew up like with our parents being like similar, like work ethic, you know, gutsy, probably yeah. somewhat stubborn and, and outspoken, I would probably add, and even though those words aren't in the book, but they create a level of discipline. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it was ever, it was, it was never like pushed to be a champion, but it was like, Hey, push to win and push to succeed and push your, your own boundaries. And then fast forward 40 years and like, I got my nephew, you know, I call him up and say like, Hey man, what was the score of the game? Oh, we don't keep score. I'm like, what the f- yeah. what do you mean? You don't keep score, dude. Yeah. Like, what do you, is this like an exercise class? Like, are we <laughs> teaching? Are we teaching people? My issue is like a lot of people, I've been through a lot of stuff you know, personally, professionally, probably like you, you know, I had some, some happen on, you know, on a relationship front. And then like, you're like, Holy shit. Like these are like, you got to experience that. You got to experience like the loss because you did then the gain actually means something, right. Yeah. It's like an emotional seesaw. So do you view like, are we going in the wrong direction? Like, oh, I didn't uh, mind the coach yelling at me, dude, yell at me, make me better, dude. Yeah, I think we're definitely going in the wrong direction in that we're so worried about the consequence of of losing the person that we're not willing to challenge the person. And if you don't challenge people, you're losing them anyway. And and most importantly, they're losing themselves. And in the end, they're going to have to swirl back. They're going to have to hire those coaches, hire those therapists to get them to say, wait, I mean, I can't tell you how many phone calls I field per week about people that say, I'm not happy. I can't find my passion. I don't know what I should be doing with my life. And it's tell like, me how many. Tell me how many. Yeah, I, tell, I'm, I, I, get, tell I probably right? get at least five a week. Damn, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot, lot right? Yeah. About people that just they don't know what to do. Yeah. And it's like, well, what are you doing? And you know what they do? They sit around, sort of like like architects, drawing bubbles as to what their life should look like, and right. they draw the perfect life, but they take no action because they don't want to get hurt. They're afraid to take the hits. And those hits, that's how you that's how you move forward. That's why I'm wearing the Rocky shirt today. You oh, I like take it. The hits. I like that. I like that. <laughs> hey, so let me ask you a question. When you talk to guys or or women who are the, who are CEOs of the company, and you start making analogies and saying, like, hey, let me tell you this time, like at the bottom of the ninth, or let me tell you this time, like when we were pulled an all nighter because like we were had to stretch somebody out and give them a shot and go through whatever. Mm. The one thing, me being an entrepreneur versus me being a soccer goalie is at the, that soccer game always ended, dude. There was always yeah. like a clock. that would be like, ah, oh, dude, like we yeah. won that game. Right. I used to be paranoid as fuck when I was sitting in the back of the net and like, like a, I know it's a minute left and like, I see an onslaught coming and I'm like, dude, I just, I'm waiting <laughs> for the clock to bring. Right. Yep. I want to, I want to run out the clock. And then I'm thinking to myself and I'm thinking of the entrepreneurs we work with and they're like, Hey man, I don't know if I can keep going. You know, I'm going to just going to give it another three months. I'm going to give it another six months. So mm. the benefit of sports was like, we got a finite amount of period time that we got to focus 
And I'm going to get you in that, that mode to be able to focus and achieve at your best during yeah. that time frame. And then we're going to win when the clock ends. So how do you take that and say like, Hey, look, I know the clock, like there is no clock. It's kind of like your life. Yeah. So how do you get people to like, say, all right, we got to do that in how? Yeah. Well, you know, coming from a sport like baseball, you know, we played over 200 games a year. So it's a different sport than a lot of the other ones and that you play almost every day, almost every night. And you can't, you have to show up, you know, you have to show up. I always say business is the most competitive sport in the world. It is a 365 event and you better be ready to play. And there's certain people that are playing this game that shouldn't be, they play it for the glory days and the glory moments but they don't play it for the hard times. And the great players, they know how to play under pressure. They know how to manage the clock, their own clock. They know how to manage energy. They know how to engage people and to get help in the spaces in which they're not good. So that's how the great ones do it. But there's certain people that are playing the game that really shouldn't be playing the game. They don't have the capacity to play. They're hard workers, Mm -hmm. but they can't play over 365. That's the difference, too, between, you know, like some minor league players and some major league players. They're good for four months, but they're not good for six. And that's why they don't make it to the same levels as somebody else. You got to be tough to play business. There's no doubt. Yeah. So I guess the question for you is because you you work with a lot of executives now. Yeah. And you got access to people that are had a bit had that have, who have been successful and are con- currently successful. And then they probably have all had, you know, their own roller coaster ride. So I guess the question is, and I've been thinking about this, like if, if you got an executive and he comes in and says, Hey, you know, Dana, like, here's my, here's my issues. Mm-hmm. You know, here's what I think I need help with. And then you come to the conclusion, like, you know what, dude, this guy just, he should have never become a banker. Like, he just yeah. not doesn't fit what he's doing. Like, do you get to a point where you tell people like, look, I've been around you for X amount of days or weeks or months. And like, dude, like that, you're, it's your profession. That's the fucking problem. Yeah. It's not you. Yeah. Hey, I, I've, I've been there with people and, and you, as a coach, right. It's, it's like, Hey Pete, I, I love you, man. But if I lie to you and I tell you what you want to hear, I'm, I'm a shitty coach and I'm not willing to be a shitty coach. Right. So people say, Hey Dan, how have you had success with these high level players, these high level business players. And I say, listen, I'm not afraid to wrestle with an alligator. They're Mm -hmm. tough. They're rude. They're oftentimes they're crude. And, and you need to be willing to spar with them and, and let them know, Hey, I care about you. And that's why I'm telling you what it is that you need to hear and not what you want to hear. Cause every other person that's on your payroll, chances are they're telling you what you want to hear. And I don't really care what you want to hear. It's what you need to hear. Did you ever get into any situations where, you know, like the head coach or like the owner or the captain of the team said, Hey man, like we appreciate your constructive criticism, but like this guy, he just can't, he can't take it. Yeah. You know, I, the only, I used to have these sort of battles um, quite a bit with not, not so much players, but, and, and he's a great friend of mine. And you see, he wrote the foreword of my book, but Joe Girardi, yeah. Joe Girardi was a guy that thought players should be doing CrossFit. And I was like, listen, you're, you're not right on this one. They shouldn't be doing this. They're not built for that. They have laxity in their shoulders. The last thing I need, I'm getting blamed anyway. So if a player goes down, I'm going to die on my own sword. So that was like a lot of, you know, and we'd go at it, but we'd always be able to talk about it. So that was really one of the only friction type situations that I had the players for the most part, when they know you have that they're back and you want them to do well and you're their biggest fan, they're going to work for you. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to ask you about is since you obviously kept a really close relationship with everyone, cause it's in the back of the book. Yeah. You know, all, all your shout outs and, and forward and, and Reggie. So how do you, how do athletes, professional athletes deal with knowing that the greatest day in their life it probably already happened. And obviously you can say, Oh, like my, I got a grandson or, Mm. you know, my daughter got married or, you know, I went to the yeshiva yesterday. No, I don't know. I don't know why I said that. I'm (laughs) Jewish though. I'm not making fun of anybody. (laughs) No. So how do like, how do you deal with people coming to me? Like, I mean, you just like coach me like, like warm life, (laughs) you know, not what I used to be doing. Yeah. You know, you know, it's kind of cool is that like when you engage with a player as a player and you do it the right way, you have a relationship for life. So it's amazing how many players like, you know, Andrew Jones, AJ Burnett, CC, all these guys that 
like we're we're always communicating even day by day like through dm on instagram and things like that Mm -hmm. but you're sort of forever their coach but these guys they they tend to struggle quite a bit when they get out of the game because you're talking about competitive thoroughbred testosterone driven racehorses that they they don't have a track to race on anymore yeah i know so you have to sort of challenge them to channel it in other ways, give them something to do. And what I realized the most important thing for these guys is the word rel- um, relevance. Yeah, so sure. start a podcast, start something where you could remain visible and you could still have engagement. Right. No matter what it is, like Phil Hughes is a guy that I coached for years. Um, and he started this, he does this thing where he, he opens up baseball cards. It's like the weirdest thing in the world, but on like YouTube or something. Yeah, on YouTube, and he's got a huge channel, and that's his way of engaging. That's cool. YouTube, Twitter, and and that keeps them happy. So they have to stay relevant, and they have to engage. And if they can do that, the chances for them to be happy and have success um, past their playing days is is high. And then you get a guy like Jeter who says, "I want more than than a YouTube channel. Right. I want to buy, you know, be a part of the Marlins." Yeah, all right. Sounds like fun. I, I guess. We're allowed to play again. <laughs> so, so uh, a, in in closing, I wanted to see if you have, happen to have a copy of your book with you. That, that that's handy. I oh, do. what do you know? Within there arm's reach, there it is. Nice prop. Nice surprise. <laughs> All right. So we got habits of a champion, and I wanted to put you on the spot here because I asked you to do an audio book, which you haven't done yet. I wanted to see if I could take you to page one thirty three, and see if you could read me the poem at the end, and then we'll close out the podcast. I'll do a little dance and shimmy. All right, cool. You ready? I'm ready, man. Give it it says, to nev- never underestimate your strength. Gain perspective in all that you face. It is never as bad as it seems. Never quit anything but bad thoughts. Go to sleep tonight. Wake up tomorrow. Attack and repeat. Tomorrow's a new day. You will have new energy, new thoughts, and new perspectives. No matter what you face, 24 months later or less, you will be renewed if you do the work. Channel your fire. Use it as fuel to become a steam engine. Become a champion. I know it is in you. Believe it is. Never quit, especially not on yourself. Fear no storms. Why? You are the storm. From the storm to yeah. God's years. Let's yeah. make this a great year. We will all bounce back. I want to hang out with you more. Let's make that happen. I look forward to seeing you in the uh, in. Wherever you want to meet on Long Island, actually. Cool. Anytime, dude. Awesome, Pete. Awesome, man. You're great talking to you. Thanks. I love it, brother. Appreciate Thanks, it. man. Good work. Thank you, guys. You got it. Later. Okay. See ya. Bye. This is Pete Moore. As you know, I am a big believer in personal development. I got a time-saving opportunity here for you recommending Dan Millman's Four Purposes of Life. Go to audible.com forward slash Halo Talks. You want to register there, get a free audio book. It's $14.95 a month thereafter, giving you things that I do to make myself better and hopefully it makes you better. Go Halo. Let's play to win.